All right, everybody, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we think this is a very important event we're putting on. Uh, for those who don't know me, Rick Gorman, uh, for the last 36 years, I've had the pleasure of being your Youth and Recreation Services director in town. It's been a ph phenomenal ride for me and working with our kids. And obviously, during those 36 years, we've seen lots of issues come up. And as a community, uh, we're great at rallying around and looking at different issues. Tonight, what we're hoping to do is to educate all of us. I think our esteemed panel, myself included, uh, don't claim to be experts on vaping. We're all trying to learn some things tonight. And I hope by 8.30 tonight, you will take some information home tonight that you and in turn can have conversations with your children and we as a community can continue to uh, address issues that come up and this one obviously is vaping. This is not gonna be a one-off. Uh, we will be talking to you at the end of the night about some follow-up stuff we're gonna be doing with vaping uh, in the next school year. Um, and Elisa Roberts from Napron will be talking to you guys about that a little bit later. So let me talk a little bit about the agenda tonight. We are going to have a six people panel here. All of these are volunteering their times. Most of these people are people that you guys will at least know a little bit about. And we'll introduce each one of them as, as we go along. They're going to speak for five or ten minutes on their area of knowledge and expertise. Uh, we're not going to take any questions during the panel discussion. After that, uh, we're going to open it up for about 30 minutes uh, for some question and answers. Hopefully, you will have questions to ask the panel. We also have a number of questions that were submitted to us uh, that if, obviously, we don't get a ton from the audience, we'll ask these questions that have been submitted by other residents. So I do want to recognize that this was a true community uh, initiative. Uh, the school department, the youth center, the North Denver Police Department, the North Denver Fire Department, the North Denver Health Department, uh, all came together to put this on. Uh, and if I can recognize a few people, most of you may know their faces, but if they could just acknowledge, raise their hand or whatever. Um, Superintendent Greg Gilligan's here tonight. We also have uh, North Denver High School Principal Chet Jackson, North Denver Middle School Principal George Galgavis. We have Chief Gray from the North End of a Police Department, along with his superior officers are here tonight. I'm not sure if there's anybody else from the fire department here tonight, but if they are, we appreciate you guys being there. Crystal Clooney, who is our support services uh, coordinator for the town of North Andover on the municipal side has done a phenomenal job in helping us put this on. Uh, so I thank you all for showing your support for being here tonight. Uh, and obviously I appreciate all the parents that came out here tonight. So on our panel tonight, uh, the six people, uh, Anthony Sideri, most of you know him as a business owner. He is also what I consider a community addiction specialist. Um, he speaks to a lot of our kids in our school system, as well as people outside of North Andover, and he's a great resource. Second is Michelle O'Leary. She's our Director of Social and Emotional Learning. Uh, she is new into this position, but has been a long time uh, public employee with the school department. She's gonna be talking about some great initiatives and how we're actually addressing some of this stuff right now. Officer and Contreras, uh, a few of your parents might know, obviously not just a police officer, but a school resource officer here at the high school. Uh, Lieutenant Neil Patnod is from the North End of a Fire Department. Uh, he's gonna be talking about a lot of safety issues around the vaping. Uh, and then we have a, a rock star fill-in. She just found out she was gonna be here 90 minutes ago. Um, and that's Kim Chivas, who is a nurse by trade, obviously a North End of a resident. Uh, she's gonna be talking about a little bit of some health stuff. Uh, the person that we did have lined up actually came down sick this afternoon, so we appreciate you, Kim, filling in. And last, and uh, probably one of the most important people on the stage tonight is Jonathan Tomito, who's a former North End of a high school student, uh, who's going to be addressing it from a little bit of the kid's perspective. So that's kind of the agenda on that. We'll open it up to Q&A. And then I'm gonna be introducing Lisa Roberts to talk a little bit about NAPRIN, which is North End of Parent 
uh, resource network and how we're looking to grow that, get more volunteers for Lisa, who's been kind of a somewhat of a one-woman show on this, as well as taking a look at we, a number of us who are involved with this, uh, are thinking about putting on a, a yearly event as well as some follow-up. Um, programs for parents, and I think it's just well overdue. I know Superintendent, Superintendent Gilligan um, supports these initiatives, and we're going to continue to work on that. Lastly, I just want to introduce uh, from the Youth Center, obviously myself, but uh, Brianna um, Gilman is our Support Services Coordinator, and Atala, Atalia Kirchi is actually our social worker. And we've been joking around with her. She is somewhat of our resident expert on vaping, paraphernalia. So she will actually be around here tonight, and she can answer many of your questions. Uh, so I appreciate my department being very involved with that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Sideri for his first piece on the panel. Thank you, Anthony. Oh, thanks. Um, hi. Um, Thanks for having me, obviously, I'm super honored whenever I get a chance to do this. I'm gonna come down because I'm gonna not feel comfortable on the stage. Thanks, again, my name's Anthony Sideri. I know a lot of you. Um, I get to see a lot of you around town all the time. I grew up in North Andover. Um, I grew up on Salem Street. I took a bus to Franklin School. Um, I went to the middle school. I went to the high school. I played varsity hockey freshman year and then I became a heroin addict and tried to rob a bank and went to jail for a while. So that's super extreme, right? <laughs> I took it a little too far, <laughs> but it all started with a small step. So I think that right now, we're looking at a problem with vaping that makes it the new gateway drug. Now, when I go and speak to schools, it's an auditorium full of high school kids. If I mention the phrase gateway drug, I lose the crowd because they don't see smoking weed anymore as a gateway drug. They don't see having a few beers in high school as a gateway. The way I try to describe a gateway drug now is like, it slightly opens the gate, right? It just is one tiny small step to then possibly making it easier to make the next step. Trying a vape, right, for a kid, this is something that's super important. Not every kid who tries to vape is gonna become a drug addict and try to rob a bank like I did. But when a kid tries a vape, if they're predisposed to addiction, like I was, so I guess like I should back up, I suffer from the disease of addiction. It was genetic. I was predisposed to it. So when I first drank a beer and when I first smoked weed, it triggered something with the chemicals in my brain and I just wanted more, so I kept doing it. And it's a, it's a disease of obsession and compulsion. So like, I became obsessed with smoking weed. I wanted to be high all the time. I think some of us are seeing that with vaping. Kids are doing it during the day. Kids are like thinking about it. They're trying to get it. They're, they're going through these addictive behaviors when it comes to something like this. Not only that, nicotine's an addictive substance. So that's why my portion of tonight is talking all about addiction. So for the gateway drug aspect, trying a vape as a kid might just open that door to make the next step not that far. Where like most kids, if they hadn't vaped before or if they hadn't like drank a beer before and then someone offers them like, hey, you wanna smoke some weed? Like they might not do it. But, and if you guys check out the display later, you can vape weed. So for some kids, if they try a vape, it's just as easy as like switching out a cartridge and now you're smoking weed. That's another small step and another small step and another small step of going down a bad path. And again, my story is super extreme. I take everything to the extreme because I'm a drug addict. So I've been clean and sober now for almost 17 years. I get a chance to speak to your kids and kids all over the place about not doing drugs. But I used to like talk more about not doing drugs. Don't, I used to actually say, don't drink in college. Like, that's extreme. I think what I talk more about now is like awareness. Let's be aware of the warning signs that we're gonna be facing when we see like what happens to our kids if they try to vape, okay? So for me, 
I started smoking weed sophomore year in high school. Just so you guys know too, I also said my first swear my sophomore year in high school. So like, when I say I took a bus to Franklin School and like I played hockey at the high school, like I was a really normal kid. My first swear was sophomore year. I also smoked weed that same year. By my senior year, I was smoking weed every day. I was obsessed with it. Before school, I would go meet up with friends and drive around and smoke weed. I would hide things from my parents. I started lying. I started all these different behaviors that I think for my parents, they didn't want to see it. They didn't want to believe it. My parents didn't talk to a lot of people. I think the saying, it takes a village, the fact that you guys are here tonight shows that like we're together as a community. We talk to each other. We watch out for each other's kids. I think for me, I slipped through the cracks because... I was like really sneaky. I was hiding things. I was like hiding my behaviors. I was, I was lying a lot, lying about who I was hanging out with. So tonight when we're talking about vaping, again, my story's extreme. But try to just listen in the terms of like, vaping could be the new gateway. So let's learn more about it. I know less than nothing about vaping. <laughs> this is like the most I've ever seen for vaping in my life, but I'm worried about my kids. My daughter's going to middle school next year. She's in fifth grade. So like, I think my daughter's predisposed to addiction. I have to be on top of that. If she tries to vape, she might like it. She might wanna do it again, and again, and again, and she might wanna smoke weed, and she might wanna do that again, and it could just lead down a bad path that starts with the smallest step. And um, that's what happened to me. So thank you for listening. Uh, any questions, we'll do them at the end and I'll pass it on down the panel. Uh, our social emotional learning director, who's gonna be talking about in a lot of ways some exciting things that the school department is looking to address vaping. Uh, and we obviously got some grant money to continue to address this. Michelle? Thanks, Rick. Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming out. And um, this is an important topic, and I'm happy to be here tonight to sh share with you some of our current programming and future plans revolving around vaping awareness in our schools. Cheryl Barzak, who's our Director of Health Services, has been hard at work uh, finding grant money to, to increase our programming um, on a yearly basis, and the focus is on the health of our students, physically, emotionally, and behaviorally. Um, so with these grants, our middle school and our high school have been able to put developmentally appropriate programming in place to educate our students on the dangers of vaping, as well as how to deal with the stresses that may lead to vaping, such as social pressure which is what led you to yours, right? At the elementary level, our education begins with responsive classroom. All of our schools are utilizing this framework, which aligns with the collaborative of academic, social, and emotional learning, which is better known as CASEL. I had to actually look it up because I just always refer to it as CASEL. So CASEL's mission in SEL, the SEL world is for our students to develop five core competencies. It is self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, rela uh, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. I said five? I think I said five. <laughs> um, so responsible decision-making, that is something that we are starting from kindergarten with our students through responsive classroom. As our students develop these skills, they are better prepared to deal with the pressures they may soon face as tweens and teens. This starts building the foundation for our students to make good choice, choices during the developmental years when they're still developing brains, try to get them to take as many risks as humanly possible. And I'm raising a 16 and soon to be 14 year old right now. And those of you with teens and tweens, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is the time where they, their brains are telling them, yeah, give that a try. Let's see, let's see what happens with that. It's developmentally appropriate, but this is why we need the education on all of this. So that's what we're doing at our elementary level, which once again, we're looking at what's, what's gonna be you know, um, taken in by our students, 
at their age what makes the most sense educationally. Once we get into middle school, this is when we get more into the core. And what we're using is the CATCH program, which is the Coordinated Approach to Child Health program. Um, after the presentation, we are going to be putting all these resources onto the North Andover Parents Resource Network. I'll spell it out for you, Lisa, okay? Um, and so I will, I will have a link to the CATCH program so you can get online and you can check it out. It has a ton of parent resources on it as well. You don't have to necessarily buy anything. It just points you in certain directions. Um, obviously, we're working with them with a, a specific curriculum. And um, that, that curriculum that we're using is the Catch My Breath program, which is specifically around vaping. Um, it's, it's about vaping awareness and education in general. Um, it utilizes a peer-led teaching approach that empowers students with the knowledge and skills needed to make informed decisions about vaping and to resist the social pressures to start. So all of the education these days, I'm sure many of you remember D.A.R.E. and you know things that may have happened in, um, it was in my younger days, a lot of that was just don't do it. Whereas now all of this education is about building the whole child and building the whole student and teaching them skills on how to resist peer pressure, how to, how to feel so confident in yourself that you can say no at a party and not feel like anything's wrong with that. Um, so this is what it's all about. It's not just about just say no, it's also about how are we building our students up so they can make these responsible decisions. Um, so Catch My Breath is the, actually the only school-based vaping prevention program that has been proven to reduce the likelihood of vaping among youth. So it has a great reputation. Um, our health and wellness teachers at the middle and high school are all trained in this program, um, as well as a couple of counselors, a couple of, of other uh, school employees have been trained as well. So uh, we're using that at the middle and the high school. Starting in sixth grade, our students are introduced to substance use prevention through the Catch My Breath curriculum. They will be also participating in the NAMS Catch Your Breath Challenge Week, during which our health and wellness teachers will throw out specific challenges for the sixth grade students and even parents and family guardians to take part in. Um, so more info to come on that, that's, that's in the works, but uh, be, be checking the NAMS website and the NAPS website um, so then you can be on top of what the challenges are. We're hoping it'll be fun and educational for our students. Our seventh graders continue with the curriculum and they end their unit in health class with a project-based public service announcement as their assessment. Crystal was just talking earlier about a seventh grader who no, was, was telling her all the information about vaping because that person just ended their project and just finished presenting to the class and had uh, more knowledge than I know I have. Um, so the seventh grade has done a really nice job. If you've been to NAMS over the last couple months, you'll see posters everywhere saying, say no to vaping, stop vaping. A lot of the pu public service announcements are now hung up all over school. Um, so our health, our health teachers, our health and wellness teachers have done a nice job with the students. And the students have really taken it to heart and they're really invested in it. And that's the most important thing because they wanna learn from each other. Students don't wanna learn from us because you know, as adults, we were never children ourselves. We never went through this, right? They wanna learn from each other and having the students take this on, take on this cause themselves is more meaningful. So it's great to go into the middle school and to see all of these homemade PSAs versus things that we can just go and buy from some educational website. It's much more meaningful for the kids. Um, and then finally, our eighth graders continue the review of the CATCH curriculum. And our health and wellness teachers, once again, we're talking about the whole body, the whole person. They're working on healthy minds and bodies in general with all the grades to help our students find positive coping strategies to deal with stress and anything that might be coming, coming their way that's going to make, um, make it harder to make good decisions. Because I know when we're stressed, we tend to not always make the best decisions. Right? When we're stressed, that's maybe when we're going to McDonald's and grabbing a quick bite. Nothing against McDonald's, but you know, I've heard it's not healthy. Um, <laughs> so what, what we wanna teach our students is what do you do when you're stressed? We don't want them turning to something that may make them feel good at the moment, but then it's bringing them down more and more every day. 
Finally, at the high school, our health, our, health, our, our health teachers continue with the Catch My Breath curriculum while also focusing on the prevention of substance use and abuse overall. At the high school, um, you know, it's, it's a, a, much, um, a much bigger program. Uh, Rachel Bopel, the head of the high school's health and wellness department, also facilitates an after-school initiative for any athletes who are facing a chemical health violation using lessons from the Catch website and small group discussion. So I said, Boston Children's motto used to be until every child is well. I don't know if you've ever seen that. They used to have it under the picture of the nurse and the child, and I'm not sure if they're still using that. But we feel that until, until every child is educated, until every child is not vaping, is not turning to substances, that's when we'll be truly happy. But is it realistic? Not, not right now but we're hopeful. And in what we're doing through our, from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, we feel like we're setting our students up for the best uh, results when it comes to decision, responsible decision making and, um, and just becoming good citizens in general. Uh, one of the things that we use for data is our 9th through 12th grade students take the Youth uh, Behavior Risk Survey every two years. It's completely anonymous, um, and this provides our school with a great deal of information about the physical and mental health of our students. And it also will, will help us see patterns. Uh, you know, we can, we can do searches by 9th graders, by 10th graders, by, by um, biological girls, boys, so it can help us see patterns too if they there's certain groups of students that we feel like are, are struggling more in one area or another. Uh, so, so I want to just share some of the numbers because we've, um, I have from 2017 all the way up to, to 2023. And uh, the first thing I'm looking at here is the lifetime vape use. So the students are asked, ever use an electronic vapors product? And it, it includes e-cigarettes, vapes, vape pens, they, they name all the, all the different things it could possibly be. So in 2017, 35% of our students said that they had tried it at some point in their lifetime. At 2023, that went down to 18%. Um, the mass average is actually 31%. So we are doing a whole lot better than Massachusetts in general. And the national average is 50% which was astonishing to me. I was, I was surprised that, that half of our population of high schoolers in this country are, have tried this at some point. Um, and then we look at current vape use. So this is for any students that identified within the last 30 days before they took the survey had they, had they used a vape product. Um, 2017, we were at 23% of our students said yes, they had. 2023, we're at 8%. And in Massachusetts, the average is 18%, and nationally, it's 11%. So we're, we're still looking good. And then the final um, question was looking at the opposite. I did not use any electric vapor products during the past 30 days. You know, sometimes these, these surveys try to word things differently to make sure that you're not just being totally negative all the time or totally positive all the time, so they switch it up. And um, our 2017 numbers were 75.5, and 2023 is 92.5% of our students that took the Youth Risk Behavior Survey said they have, have do not use um, and have not used any sort of um, vapes or anything like that in the last 30 days. So I feel like those are great numbers. And like I said, until every child well, we want those numbers to continue going down for uh, usage and we want the numbers to continue going up for the kids that are saying no to it. So um, I'm really excited for the ongoing um, initiatives that we're gonna be doing in the schools and um, thank you so much for listening tonight.
Thank you very much. My name is Officer Jonathan Contreras. I'm with the North Andover Police Department. I'm currently the school resource officer here at the high school. I'm gonna talk about what I see mostly, and that's nicotine and tobacco products. So let's jump right into it. Vaping Awareness Night. You might think since we're having this awareness night, it's a big problem here in North Andover. I just wanna let you guys know that the vaping is a problem across the country and every single school in the United States, not just North Andover. E-cigarettes, electronic smoking devices, vapes, or better known by the students as SPOs, are a danger to our kids. Vapes contain causing, uh, cancer causing chemicals that affect the, the development of the brain and lead to addiction. Now, this is why it's important for all of us to be educated. I don't know everything, and I'm here to also educate myself and everything that's going on in the high school and elementary school and middle school. It's a collaborative effort between all of us, the police, the schools, but most importantly, you, the parents, parents, you got to know what's going on underneath your roof. There are signs and there are clues to look for to help you determine if you're having a problem at home. And if you are having a problem at home, there are plenty of resources out there to help you. Do you guys know that talking to your kids about the dangers of vaping decreases the possibility of drug use by 50%. Vapes are the new cigarettes. Different product, same dangers. Depending on the brand of the vape, one vape equals 20 cigarettes. But now let's get into the police side of things. Massachusetts realizes that there's a problem with underage vaping. Massachusetts has, has put some restrictions and some laws into place to try to impact this problem. In order for you to purchase a vape, you have to be 21 years old. For those under the age of 21, they're not supposed to have it. But the law has not caught up to the new technology. So there is no charge for a minor in possession. Massachusetts has also put some penalties in place to punish those that sell to minors. Mass General Law 270, Section 6. Massachusetts also has go gone as far as to stop the sale of flavored vapes. Now, from what I've dealt with, no kid wants to smoke a regular vape. They want the vapes that taste good and smell good. Massachusetts has banned the sale of flavored vapes in Massachusetts. Lastly, a few years ago, Massachusetts banned smoking inside of a building, inside buildings, which leads me to my next point, school and school administrators. School administrators have done a great job trying to impact these problems inside the schools. Believe it or not, school officials can discipline a child more than I can. North Andover has bylaws in place, a ticket that you give a person for smoking inside of a building. If I gave a student a ticket, who am I really punishing? Am I punishing the kid or am I punishing the parent? Because who's going to pay for it? If this 12-year-old kid received this ticket, and it's $120, $100, who's really paying for it? Schools have rules and policies in place that will allow them to give a detention, suspend a student, 
expel the student in certain situations if they're caught vaping inside the school, on school grounds, or at a school event. School officials go off a reasonable suspicion which means a reasonable person must believe something has occurred. While us, the police, we go off probable cause, which means we rely on objective circumstances and evidence when dealing with situations like this with kids. In any case, parents are informed and school dif discipline is the preferred approach and response in most cases. As officers, we were once kids. We know kids make mistakes. We as officers view the totality of the circumstances. We use our discretion and we make our decision when dealing with kids. We are not here as a police department to scare these kids, arrest these kids. We are here to educate them, educate you guys. We are here to support, be mentors, be a positive role model to them to look up to in and out of uniform. Like I said before, this problem isn't going to fix itself. It's a collaborative effort. Us, the police, school administrators, but most importantly, you, the parents. I know you guys are going to have some questions for me. I'll, hopefully, I'll be able to answer them later today. I thank you for your time. John, thank you, John. Again, I'm sure you will have some uh, questions for him. We'll wait till the panel's over. Next up is uh, Lieutenant Neil Patnod. Uh, when we think of the fire department, we think of obviously responding to certain things. Uh, Neil's going to be touching base on the education piece and some of the safety things that our fire department uh, is, is working with our community around vaping. Neil? Is it working? Yeah. It's all right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, the fact that you're all here tonight shows, you know, not only support for what we're doing, but just shows that you're concerned generally with what's going on with generally what's going on in your households, in the schools, and things like that. So before I get into my four main talking points, conversation starters, uh, just quickly about myself. I graduated from the school in 2007, graduated from Mass Maritime in 2011. I have a degree in emergency management. I joined the fire department in 2013, and I recently took over as the public fire life safety coordinator, and that's where my angle is gonna be today, um, fire and life safety. So. Our biggest recommendation, and to kind of echo what the police department was saying, is to create a conversation with the people in your household, whether it's a, a roommate, your child, your, your <clears throat> nephews, your nieces, anything like that. Anyone that's under your, under your roof, you have the right to know what's going on involving them. So I have four, four, four points, excuse me, of concern from the fire department in regards to fire safety. So my number one concern, um, the children who may be hiding things from you, uh, specifically the electronic cigarettes or the rechargeable apparatus or whatever it is that you want to call them, um, they're likely to hide them, and Jonathan's probably going to speak to this, but under their pillows, under their mattresses, in their closet, under a pile of hoodies, um, specifically from the fire department, we have had small fires related to vapes charging under pillows and in closets. Now. I'm not saying that every kid that vapes is gonna have a fire in their house, but what I'm suggesting is for a conversation starter with your child, that it's a safety concern, not only for them, but for you and for their siblings and their grandparents or whoever else it may be living in your house. Uh, number two, underwriters laboratories, UL labs, they list all devices in regards to fire safety standards. Um, a lot of these vapes are tested with a specific charger, or the e-cigarettes are tested with a specific charger that they come with. 
Now what we're seeing is the kids go to, they go to CVS or Quick Pick or wherever and they buy a rapid charger. Those rapid chargers are not always compatible with the device, even though when they plug it in, it charges. So what we're seeing happening is they, you know, they plug that in, they plug the USB thing into their computer or into their battery pack for their phones, and they're charging them at a rate that they're not designed to accept. Similar to like, you know, your cell phone gets hot if it's charging too fast. So these, these devices are basically combusting in whatever they have in their backpack, in their pockets, in their, you know, in their car, purses, lunchbox, whatever it is that they're charging them in. So that's another topic um, to maybe suggest to your children and maybe bring about a conversation, a different angle for you. Um, the third one, counterfeit products, um, off-brand, you know, foreign manufactured, made wherever, that don't necessarily meet the safety standards of underwriter laboratories or other agencies that oversee these. There's lack of quality control that can result in internal failures, um, internal failures resulting from them being dropped, being smashed in a book, uh, not being stored properly, not being ventilated while they're charging. Um, so, you know, this comes from buying them on Amazon or buying them secondhand or buying something that was maybe, uh, you know, refurbished. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of this with the lithium ion batteries. Uh, it's cheaper to have a battery repaired or buy one secondhand than it is to replace the whole device. So the battery that they're reusing is generally not compatible with the initial device, causing short circuits. You know, and sometimes it's just, you know, this little device here catches on fire and it puts itself out. But now if you have this in your closet in the bedroom because they're hiding it from you and then they're afraid to say that there's a fire, now, now we have a, a, you know, a smoldering pen that results in a full-blown room and contents fire. Um, at the end of this, I'm going to provide some links through, through Lisa Roberts to USFA, uh, U.S. Fire Administration and FEMA. <coughs> that have links through uh, the fire department in New York. They've had hundreds and hundreds of fires, not all vape specific, but battery specific. And it gives tons of information on prevention, what to look for, and different things like that. So we'll, we're gonna send that out and I'll get you the exact link for it. And uh, my final talking point, the, the materials themselves in the vape, the liquid cartridges, um, some of them have been known to ignite uh, when they're exposed to heat, when they break. Uh, they're left in a car, they're left in the sun. Um, depending on what they're made from, there's a whole new safety concern with that. So all I wanted to do tonight was present topics to maybe encourage a conversation with your kids and um, without getting too far into it. So any, any further questions, can, we can either have them at the end or they can go through NAPRIN and I can answer them specifically, but I didn't want to take up too much time on it. Thank you, Neil. Uh, next up is Kim Chivas. Kim's a North Andal resident, but as a registered nurse, she's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the health concerns that she's actually seen in her line of work. Kim? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, as um, Rick told you, I told, found out about this an hour ago and sitting on my couch, so I'm doing a favor for a very good friend. Um, so I'll do my best. But basically, um, I'm just gonna go off the cuff here. I uh, also was a, um, a North Andover High School parent um, not too long ago and in your seats. Um, my two daughters both graduated from this awesome school and I'm, I'm so glad to see that there's programs like this um, going on now because this is an important um, issue that needs to be discussed. Um, I, let's see, graduated from nursing school from Boston College in 1990, and since then, pretty much I've worked at Mass General Hospital, um, always in pediatrics, and uh, for the most part of that in the pediatric ICU, where I am there um, uh, up to this day. Um, it's been kind of a roller coaster ride in the, uh, in the medical world, as you can imagine, with all the things that have gone on over the last decade. Um, one of the newer things had been this um, abundance of this new juuling and vaping, um, and what's this doing to our kids. Um, and we were seeing some definite, um, definite patterns um, going along in the early years of this, um, I'd say, probably when my kids were just going into the high school. And I think probably around, Kate actually graduated with Jonathan. Um, 2019. 
2019, yeah. So around there, it was just mostly at the high school. And I, in particular, were, I was very sensitive to this only because um, my two daughters also had a um, severe lung disease. They both have cystic fibrosis. So I was kind of on high alert for all this and trying to educate myself about what this meant and you know, how much more dangerous were these than cigarettes? And how, what did this mean for anybody nearby? And if they, ever had, if they ever had any of this in their lungs, what would it do? So I started to learn about you know, how severe even, the, even there's the smoke and the molecules that you're, you're putting out into the atmosphere when you're exhaling these. They're, it's basically a very sticky substance. So when you're near somebody vaping or in a room with somebody vaping or in a car with somebody vaping, and you inhale that, like whatever else is in the atmosphere, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, is clinging on to those molecules and also being sucked into your lungs and then they kind of stick there like hairspray in your lungs. So if that gives you a good visual, that's how I saw it and that's what it actually does. So the trends we were seeing, I'd say pre-pandemic were um, kids that usually would come in for let's say an asthma attack or, an, or a pneumonia, that you would expect them to be in the hospital for maybe you know, four or five days or a week. Um, they were having prolonged hospitalizations. Um, and when you came down to a common factor of what was causing this and what could possibly be different than what we were seeing before was that they're either in a house where there was vaping or there were with a college roommate that was vaping. And so um, we all started to really pay attention to this because it was causing um, more injury on top of an existing condition or an infection. So um, high alert for that. We all started to talk about it. It wasn't even on our intake. I mean, we take a data intake when these kids come to the hospital and ask their history. And, and that wasn't even on our intake form, I think, five years ago. And all of a sudden, now we're asking them, do you vape? Are you around somebody that vapes? Are you a college student? Are your dear roommates vape? Just because it really can indicate how severe your illness course is going to, to be. Um, I um, also, it, we saw a big drop off. I, I remember seeing a big drop off during the pandemic because, you know, all the kids were wearing masks or they weren't in school. And all of a sudden, everything kind of got back to normal with the asthmatics and the kids that had pneumonia. Like we didn't really see the, the trajectory being as long or as severe. So the pandemic ended and everybody put their, their mask on again. And guess what's popular again? Long hospital stays with, with um, some pretty severe um, injuries to the lung. It can cause um, pneumothorax, which is you know spontaneous um, combustion of your lung. It's a very serious condition. I've seen four of those in the last two years. Um, I've seen uh, very nice teenage boys. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of one who missed probably half of his junior year because he had a pneumonia, he had been a vapor, and uh, you know he ended up almost getting a lung transplant. I think you've heard of popcorn lung. Um, it does exist. Um, he ended up with a tracheostomy. He ended up at Spalding Rehab for a year, um, and he survived. But you know he lost all of his pretty much all of his good high school memories right there. Um, so that was one of the more severe cases that we've seen in pediatrics. But um, I think the trend is just um, starting to pick up again, and I'm so glad that you guys are, are talking about this. Um, um, I think that's you know pretty much the, the gist of it uh, for me. Um, I really hope that the school system you know just keeps pushing the message that people need to communicate. You really need to talk to your kids. Um, I think that when kids take into um, account maybe that there are other kids, even though they think they're safe and they think they're good doing it and they're going to be fine and it's not going to hurt them, make them aware that, you know what, you might have a kid in your classroom with bad asthma or you might have a, a kid in your classroom with an immunosuppressive disease or something that you just don't know about uh, or in your car or at the party or in the dorm room. So just be aware that what you're ex exhaling into that room is really going to hurt and affect somebody else also on top of yourself. So I think that even when kids can't take a second to think about their own bad decisions, which they're going to make a million, million bad decisions. I mean, we've had kids hide the vapes under the pillow at the hospital after being in the hospital for pneumonia. Like, they just are kids. They're not thinking. But if you make them aware that, you know, geez, that could really help, that could really hurt your best friend Kate, or that could really hurt your best friend Laura, you know, I really did see a good response from that. So if you make them start to care about their community, and this is such an awesome community, it always has been, um, I think you're one up on the game and just keep up all the good work, everybody. Thank you, Kim.
Uh, last one on our panel. Uh, our committee actually thought it was really important to have a young person uh, that kind of grew up in our community, obviously attended North End of a school system, graduating here at North End of a high school, to kind of give you a little bit of the kid's perspective on that. Jonathan Tamino is obviously a young adult now, but he's going to be talking as a young adult, but also with the memories of being a North End of a high school student. Thank you so much. I'm going to stand up and come down too. I got a lot of energy, so <laughs> going to walk around. But yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you everyone else for speaking as well too. So I, and thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. Um, I saw her post on North Hanover Moms saying fourth graders were vaping, and that was very concerning to me. So that's why I wanted to come out here and speak. And so um, I graduated from North Hanover High in 2019, and so I work in uh, construction as a superintendent, and I also own a small auto detailing business in North Andover. And so vaping is very personal to me just because I have family, mem family members, unfortunately, who have dealt with it, and it's been a, a long struggle for them. You know, I have one of my family members, he started vaping at 14. In 25, he is still addicted to nicotine products. So I think the, you know, the big message is something that you might start out as a social thing. Like, hey, you know, I'm at a party, this kid hands me this device, either a jewel, a Zin, or one of these disposables, which are extremely popular. You know, something you do once or twice turns into an, a long, over a decade. And it's one of those things where you don't know the research, there's not enough information out that you don't know the long-term effects. Just like when cigarettes were around, when they first came out, no one had any idea. And then, you know, cancer, all the other things that came with it. So it is one of those things that you can start as a completely harmless, you know, once or twice, and it could lead to years and years of usage. And he's tried to quit many, many times and has not been successful. And with all the new products to the market, for example, Zin, it's just more ways to get our youth, unfortunately, hooked. And like I said, I graduated from 2019. The first time I think I tried to vape was maybe my junior or sophomore year. You know, walking into the bathroom, it was a very common thing you'd see, unfortunately. And it's one of those things where as you walk in, you know, kids are doing it more as like a social thing. And then it turns into, okay, well, now I wanna get one. Okay, well, now my friend's also gonna get one. And I kind of have that regret of starting it. Luckily, I was able to quit. But I have some friends who, you know, my age, 22, and they're still doing it. And I introduce them to that, which is, you know, it's tough. It's very, very hard to quit. And I feel bad that my friends are still, some of my friends are still stuck doing that. And, you know, I think it was great. Italia made this display to show all the different types of um, vapes. And... Um, one really scary fact I saw is that um, nicotine, obviously we all know, is one of the most highly addictive things, but a one single Jew pod, which she has displayed here, contains about uh, 20 uh, cigarettes worth of nicotine. Kids in my class, they were using one of those a day. So it just shows how strong this is and why kids just, you just can't go cold turkey. Just the uh, concentration of nicotine is so strong. And one of these, you know, so small you can fit in your pocket, and that's one of the reasons why Juul blew up and was so you know, popular. This sleek, they called it the apple of vaping. It's a sleek thing that you can hide. Kids would put it in their sleeves. You, you, there would be no exhale, so you wouldn't see any smoke, no odor, nothing. So it was very easy to hide and very hard for parents to locate. And I think that's obviously a big, it's great that you guys are all here, and I think it's a big issue to like know that, you know, these are just hard to find. If your kid is using it, it is hard to really know just because it's so easy to hide. These disposables, you never have to refill, so they're never, there's never gonna be, I don't think there's bottles of liquid hiding around. You don't have to charge them. Once they're done, either like a week or two of usage, they're, you know, trashed, you know, and they can hide it in a draw, hide it behind, whatever. It is very, very hard to locate. And like I said, the way the, um, they market these, it's all intentional to appeal to the youth with the different flavors, the uh, fancy colors. Um, there was actually a great dark, a little off topic, but there's a great documentary of, of how Jewel was founded on Netflix. And it, you know, their big thing was basically advertising it as this hip new thing that you, know, you wanna try, you wanna do. And like I said, you know, something that can be so harmless of trying it once or twice can turn into a, a full blown addiction. And the, um, the first time I saw Jewel, uh, it was, I think, like I said, about like 15 but vaping was still even before that, but it was not with these devices. They were much easier to notice these big box mods, they'd call them, and it'd be the large clouds of smoke. That's how vaping originally started. But now, 
like I said, it's so discreet. There's new products coming onto the market all the time. I think I saw one parent come up here and say there was like a highlighter vape, and I think I did see a photo or two of that, and you know, that's very concerning, and you know, it looks like a highlighter. You know, how are you supposed to know is that a vape or is it not a vape? And the first time I saw Jew, I thought it was just a little flash drive. So, and then I saw someone putting them up. I'm like, what is that? You know, is that marijuana? You know, it's very, very hard. And so um, with this display, I recommend all you guys check this out. Atalia, um, obviously the main thing is nicotine, but I think, um, you know, weed is another thing. We have some THC pens that you should just get aware because these are very, very popular as well too. And the same thing, this yellow one on the front, you know, same size as a jewel, basically no odor. Obviously if you smoke marijuana, very loud, you know, you can smell it, et cetera. Easily noticeable, these slip in your pocket, it's the same thing, it's very easy to hide. And so I just did look up some information as well too. So, you know, um, when I spoke to Rick last Friday in Italia, they were saying a lot of students were using vaping for um, anxiety and stress. And I saw a study of more than uh, 2,500 people aged 13 to 24 found that they were likely to report anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms, and even suicidal thoughts when compared with their peers who didn't vape. So, you know, that's a scary thing that a lot of kids might try using this nicotine as a stress reliever when in fact it's, you know, not causing that at all, you know, or it's not helping that at all. It's just making those symptoms worse. So, trying to, and then, um, you know, like as going back to nicotine is highly addictive and it's, it's just available everywhere. Um, the first, when I got my first shoe, I think I just, this was years ago, I don't think you can do this anymore, but you could just order it right online. No ID, nothing, you could deliver it right to your door, super discreetly, very hidden. But then the other issue obviously is in New Hampshire, um, I think it's 21 now, but it was 18 when I was in high school. So, you know, older seniors, they would just go and they'd get them for um, younger students, et cetera. But it's still, you know, a lot of these places don't, I would go to places they never carded. So, you know, it's just very hard to know if your, your kids got it or not. But I just, um, one good thing Italia put up here is just the pricing too. I mean, you can see some of these are very expensive. So I think that might be um, a good way to uh, tell if your son or a kid is vaping, is just looking, you know, are we seeing a common occurrence of $20, $20, $15, $10, either through Venmo or just if you had a shared checking? Because like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to um, track these. But I, I think a big thing as parents is just having like an honest discussion is like, you know, like, Obviously, when you're younger, you know, everyone makes bad decisions and tries new things. When you're young, you feel invincible. So, you know, and you're more, you're risk adverse. So I think it's just, you know, something that you might, they might see as harmless doing one or two times. Like I said, can turn into a, a decade of, you know, usage. And so the long-term effects are just not out with that. So we just don't really know so far. And I have a brother, uh, the same thing, you know, he started vaping, I think around 16, 17. And you know, he's 24 and the same thing. Unfortunately, he's just about quitting, but he's tried many, many times either through, you know, nicotine alternative or just like therapy. And it's just very, very hard to quit. So, but I think that's all I really have to say, but I appreciate you guys all being here and uh, you know, trying to go understand. It's a lot. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, uh, that's going to conclude our panel discussion. Uh, Lisa's going to head up uh, to the up the hallway here a little bit. We would like to have a little bit of a question and answer period. Um, I do ask you when we conclude, if you haven't seen the display put uh, put together by Italia, Italia and Brianna will be here. They can explain a lot. It would be a good idea to take a look at some of the stuff that many of our panel has talked about. So in terms of the Q&A, we've tried, to, we want to keep this to be as positive a night as possible. I am going to ask you not to ask specific questions that may have to deal with how a school is directly handling things like our bathrooms or whatever. I have been told uh, if you have questions around that, you know, contact the assistant principals at the middle school and the high school. They'd be happy to tell you what their policies, what they're doing with that. But with tonight, we're really looking forward to asking some questions of these six people here uh, that have a lot of experience and can answer some of the questions that you may be thinking in the last hour that you'd like to ask. So uh, if anybody has a question, uh, Lisa is over here. We have a, another microphone there. Uh, we'll start off with a, an email uh, question that we got. Um, and maybe uh, any of you guys can take this one. It's, uh, it's a little bit tough. Um, Besides a strip search, how do I find a vape when I think my child is vaping? 
Anybody want to take that one? It's on? It's on. Oh, it is? Okay, now it's on? Okay, there we go. Um, can you say that one more time, Rick? I'm sorry. Basically, as a little tongue-in-cheek, I'm sure, she basically said, besides doing a strip search, how can I actually know that my child has vaping stuff or is vaping? I would say if they're, like, they're kind of seen off, I guess you could say off the edge, because one of those things with nicotine, you know, when, if someone has to smoke a cigarette, you know, you can kinda, they need to go outside, et cetera. Obviously, vaping, you don't need to do that. But let's say maybe he's always having, or your, um, your child is always having their door closed, or maybe they're, I guess you could say, sp I, I would go in the bathroom, I would spend extra time showering, whatever, that could be a sign, prolonged times of in the bathroom. Um, I think that um, maybe, like I said, having the door closed, maybe the lights off, because it's just so easy to hide. But, um, you know, I would look for some of the, you know, if the boxes, for example, if you're seeing boxes, um, you know, maybe you're seeing some of the disposables scatter around, that's a clear sign. And so, you know, like I said, it's kind of, there's not really a, a smell that's kind of like tough, but I would just say, like I said earlier, regarding the, um, the money aspect wise, is that if you constantly see these either through Venmo of the, the five, 10, $20, that's like just a clear sign in my opinion, so. Thank you, anybody else on the panel want to take anything on that? Sure, I'll just, um, I'll just add, and I was gonna also double down on the money aspect. The money aspect is huge. This stuff's not free. So the kids have to buy it either from other kids or online or something. So monitoring the spending is huge. Um, but also changes in behavior. So when you start to become addicted to a substance, you change your behavior. Now, obviously, noticing behavior changes in teens is probably pretty crazy because they're changing all the time. But you know your kid. You know when they're starting to act a little funny when they're lying, when they're sneaking around, that's the kind of stuff to look out for. Something else is like when they don't have the substance that they're addicted to, they will become extremely irritable. They'll start to snap, mood swings. That's the kind of stuff you look for. So if you think your kid's possibly addicted, not just trying it, but like addicted, if you shut off the stream of money, they can no longer buy it they'll start to get extremely irritable and stuff like that, you'll notice, and then you can have that conversation. Instead of having the conversation about, are you trying this, you can have the conversation about, how can we help you because we think you're addicted to this. Um, and those conversations are huge. Open lines of communication are huge. Um, something I talk about in the schools is like, when reality started crashing down on me, because like, when you're using drugs or vaping, or when you're addicted to something and you're in this world of like seeking it, obsessing about it, looking for it, you're in a fantasy world. You're not really like dealing with responsibilities and you're not like taking a chance to look up and like look around. So when reality starts crashing down, like shutting off money, having real talk conversations, um, super important. Thanks. John, do you want to add something on that? I kind of was going to say the same thing everyone else said up here, but um, like new chargers flowing around, some of these are rechargeable, so new chargers flowing around, the money situation. A lot of these um, vapes actually do have that uh, a flavored uh, smell, watermelon, you start smelling that in the air, and you're like, what is going on here? Might be a vape. Um, like you said, they're, like everyone said up here, they're very easy to hide, but you got clues out there. Like I said, the chargers, the money is the big thing. A lot of these kids are very young. How are they paying for this? You give, you give them an allowance of $25, now they're asking for 50. Why? 75, why? And like he said, attitudes change. Once you get addicted and you need it and you're not getting the money for it, you have, your behavior starts to change. Thank you. How about one more, and then we'll see if there's any public ones. Um, this is probably addressed towards our school reps, uh, as well as anybody else in the panel weighs on this. If your child is, is a recovering vapor, um, what is offered at the school uh, to support kids trying to stop? Uh, or are there anything like Vaping Anonymous out there for kids? So um, 
in terms of the support within the schools, all of our schools are, are um, full of counselors that are available. Um, we don't necessarily have uh, uh, groups, but it's definitely something that we can look into. Um, as you know, the middle school and high school have after school activities. And um, if there's a student that says, you know, a few of us are, are really learning more about vaping and we want to form a vaping awareness group or, you know, how to stop, or if it's a group of kids that at the high school level have said we've tried it, been there, done that, don't like it, and we want to educate more of our, our peers, they can certainly go to um, administrators and ask if they can put a group together. Um, so within the schools, it's um, you know looking to our support personnel, and, um, and then we can go from there if there's interest in that. In terms of just outside of school, um, a good website that I found is, and I want to get this right, it's teen.smokefree.gov. And it's a obviously a government website that's looking at how how to help your child um, quit vaping, and it gives you know lots of information in terms of a plan and how to go through it and all of that. It even has a texting program, so if your if your child I think they have to be between 13 and 17 years old if they're trying to quit, they can sign up to receive daily texts that will just be basically be on them about um, you know I think it's probably some positive stuff, not just all you know. Don't pick up the vape today. I'm sure there's a lot of um, a lot of esteem building uh, messages that come out too, but that might be a good option if you have a student that you're looking to to try to quit. But uh, to to echo what Anthony was saying, go about it as as a family. You know, um, if if any of you are are caffeine addicts, you know that if someone just said to you, "Stop drinking coffee." Um, might not be the easiest day or week or month for you. And if a student really is addicted to, to the chemicals and to the nicotine, then y you to just say, knock it off and just punish them. I don't know if that's gonna get as far as to say, hey, I found this program online, let's do this together. We're gonna find, we're gonna pick your quit day, we're gonna decide how, we're, how you're gonna go about it and we're gonna help you every step of the way. The more you can be a part of that, um, the more supported they'll feel and I think the, the more success you'll find. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the audience? Actually, I'm going to give the microphone because I guess to pick up, we are taping this tonight to show the community. Thank you, and thanks everyone for this um, night. It's super helpful, and we feel so fortunate to have it. Um, without getting into statistics, have you seen a higher prevalence of vaping with females versus males? I'm assuming males. I hate to make that stereotype, but just out of curiosity. Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I'm not sure of any statistics, but um, off the top of my head, I'd say we see more boys um, at the hospital, but there's this, this really no difference. There were girls too, so it's, I don't know if anyone's following that. Um, they all seem to be um, doing it equally, so. And I'd say back to one of the other questions too, I'd pipe in and say just really pay attention to their friend group if you're wondering um, back to one of the email questions. If you're wondering if your kid is is um, is possibly vaping, uh, vaping, or and I think that goes for anything, drinking, smoking weed, and doing drugs, anything. I think it's really important to pay attention to what their friend group is doing because chances are, if they're close friends and their new friend group or even their old buddies, this is their new fun thing. Chances are they're doing it too. I'll just throw in, uh, in regards to the youth center, uh, Talia and I have been talking about, we're actually seeing, I would probably say it's slightly more boys, but you'd be surprised with how many girls that we're dealing with directly at both uh, the high school level and, and obviously at the middle school level point. Um, so I don't think there's any real hard numbers on that, but I think it's across the board, both genders on that. Um, let me go, before we get another audience, and yet another great question. This was actually submitted by a couple of people, and I'll kind of paraphrase it. This might be uh, Jonathan or Jonathan on this, but uh, in terms of social media, 
what's coming out is uh, kids are actually being able to connect, uh, access, meet up with a person that maybe be selling paraphernalia, that type of thing. Um, do you see that a lot? Is there anything that can be done for that around the whole piece of social media and access? Do you want to go? Or do you wanna? So in terms of social media and meeting, meeting up with someone in order to purchase these vapes, so like I said, you got to look at this, uh, the vaping situation, and I'm talking about nicotine and tobacco products like the cigarette. When cigarettes were popular, what was the charge? There was no charge. Now, for an adult or a storefront, yes, there are charges out there. There are penalties for these stores that are selling. Um, like I said, Massachusetts has tried to do um, a good job on, I mean, they are doing a good job on restricting the sales of flavored vapes. But unfortunately, like I mentioned before, the laws have not caught up to the new technology, so there are sometimes no charges for situations like this in terms of an adult meeting up with a, a minor, or if it's a minor on a, if it's a minor with another minor, uh, there are no charges, unfortunately, and that's why we we're here tonight. We're trying to educate, um, like Jonathan mentioned. Uh, it's getting better. It's like cigarettes, when they first came out, it was like a cool, popular thing to do. Then they started realizing all the health problems, and that's where we're coming now. And I, I guarantee you there are gonna be some laws put into place because of uh, the dangers and the effects it's having on, uh, on our kids. Jonathan, did you wanna add anything on that? Nope, oh, there we go, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, going back to your question too, um, so I work in Boston, close to all the colleges, Northeastern, uh, BC. I would say, honestly, I think it's just as common with females compared to boys. I mean, I notice with a lot of females, it's a lot of like the, the fruity flavors, the more fancy flavors like appeal. Like I see a lot, when I walk in Gogan Munch, I see a lot of young college kids, girls and females, or excuse me, males and females, both vaping. Um, and I think if you see, the, like I said, the Zin down there, that's becoming very popular in the, um, for males. It's basically um, like chewing tobacco, but just basically pouches. Um, that's very, very common, especially in my age, like 22 and like 25. I think it's slowly trickling down too, to like, you know, the high school as well too. But um, going back to Rick's question regarding social media, um, yeah, that was definitely a common way. There was always one person you know, who you could connect with too, who was in the high school on social media, M mainly Snapchat, and you know, you'd be selling, you know, the puff bars, the elf bars, et cetera. And you know, it's very hard to catch unless you do a strip of that person's backpack, you know, to see if they have it. And then another big thing was just, um, you know, meeting in bathrooms, using, connecting on Snapchat to like meet in this bathroom, and, you know, go vape in this bathroom, et cetera. That was just a very um, popular thing I noticed as well too, but. Thank you. Any questions, another question from the audience? I know we're not asking any questions about the schools right now, but um, maybe for fire and police, how effective are the vaping alarms? Do you know anything about the vaping alarms? the alarms and the detectors? I'm not really sure, um, but I will tell you this. At the high school, I believe there is no uh, vaping alarms. All right, it's something that they're looking into. I know that, something that's been brought up to my attention, but as of right now, I believe there are no alarms to detect vaping. Neil? Uh, just from the fire department angle on any type of alarms, I don't have a specific number on that. I can follow up with the contacts at uh, the State Department of Fire Services and try to get you a hard number on that. But like the officer was saying, I don't know of any in the building. It uh, doesn't mean there aren't any, though. All right. I'll take your thing, too, yeah. Anthony? Um, I happen to work as a barber, so I cut a lot of people's hair, and I cut some school administration from the area. So a totally different school, not this one. And I spoke um, at length about vape detectors because one of the schools locally added like an extreme vape detection system in all the bathrooms. Their vape detection system is connected to their cameras. So when the vape detector goes off in the bathroom, 
that captures a picture of who came out of the bathroom next. They're compiling information, and when they catch someone three or five times, okay, now we know you're definitely the one setting off the detector. The detectors also can detect levels of THC in the vape. Now, these detectors were like insanely expensive and kind of like to what end? There isn't a criminal charge for the kids that are doing it. So we're catching these kids. They might get in trouble with the school, but mostly the school that I'm speaking of mostly wants to just let the parents know, hey, your kid's vaping. Maybe have a conversation with your kid. So um, I think it's an extreme measure, but also like pretty effective for just singling out the people. And again, like bringing reality down on those kids because um, they're in a fantasy world. If they're going in the bathroom at school during the day, they're thinking that nothing's wrong, but it is. So um, got to just like get to the bottom of it. But yeah, I think it's like a lot of money. So Another email uh, question. Um, and we kind of, I think in the panel answered it a little bit but maybe Kim and others can jump. Is nicotine itself dangerous, or is it all the other chemicals in the vape? Um, well, of course, nicotine's horrible for you. Um, I think everybody's educated on that, but the chemicals are really, really, they're very toxic that are in the, um, in the vapes. They actually, um, I just was reading actually before this that there's chemicals in the, um, what colors it and what flavors it specifically that are similar to the chemicals that you find in weed killer and um, antifreeze and oh, there was a list of five things. It was really bad. So I think all of those, we still don't know. We don't know long-term studies. I mean, this is a pretty new, um, you know, a new um, phenomenon that we're seeing. And I think until we're down the road another decade and we see what these kids' lungs look like at the age of 30 and 40, we're gonna look back at this and be like, oh my God, why didn't we do something about this sooner? I know that there's a, a syndrome called um, a valley and it's a, a vapor-induced um, lung injury. And the most popular, the, the biggest, um, the biggest um, number of of kids that have this, so the age group of 19 to 21, and they're requiring lung transplants, and it's bad. So it's that's just 19 to 21 year olds. So I can only imagine all these other kids that are going to be falling right behind them at the age of 30 and 40, and really struggling. So I think the chemicals in the whole mix, never mind the nicotine, are are massive issue, very toxic. Any other questions from the audience? Lisa will get you the mic right there. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by thanking you all for sharing your knowledge and your expertise tonight. Um, I believe it was Officer Contreras. You mentioned um, some of the uh, a slang term that some of the kids are using for uh, a popular slang term for the for the vapes. Um, would you mind repeating that? And then, are there other um, slang terms that that you're aware of, or any of you aware of that the kids are using for either? the vapes themselves or for the act of vaping? So as, as a committee, we actually spent some time talking about it. I'll have Officer Contreras answer your question. I think Jonathan can add to it too. We actually wanna make sure everybody's understanding the terminology. Uh, there's, in the terminology, and Jonathan probably knows better than anybody, probably changes on a regular basis, but I think as parents, you guys need to know what these words the kids are saying. So I'll, I'll start with Officer Contreras. So the most popular one I've heard, and actually the only one I've heard, is SPOS, S-P-O-S, SPOS, for vaping. And that's uh, nicotine and tobacco products. I'm not talking about the marijuana ones, but SPOS. Jonathan, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah. Okay, so there we go. Uh, yeah, same thing, the most popular I heard is just DISPOS, so just a D-I in front of that, basically. I would say that's the most common, and like I said, um, most of those vapes are disposed, disposables, and so that's why that nickname is uh, so prevalent. Great, thanks. Other questions from the audience? I, yes. Can I add one? Yeah, um, someone who sells through social media is called a plug. Thank you. Can I just say that um, that is an excellent question, and I'm going home to Google that. 
immediately. So thank you. Other questions from the audience? There's a mic right there. So Jonathan, you mentioned about uh, Snapchat. I just wanted to understand if there are any other social media, I know, uh, other than Snapchat, which we should be worried about. Because uh, the reason I'm asking, uh, because my daughter is in eighth grade, and she was asking us, you know, oh, we, we, you know, my other friends have Snapchat, and my wife was like, really, like, she's like, okay, you have the phone, you can keep messaging us, but right now, no Snapchat. And she was really obsessed about Snapchat, so I think maybe it's a very popular one, that's why it is, is, is are there any others? Great question. Um, Snapchat is definitely the most popular, I think, is just because it's so discreet. Just because with the main appeal of Snapchat is the messages delete instantly. So, like, let's say your parent, obviously, with iMessage or Instagram, you know, you can see you can see the history, whereas if Snapchat, it deletes instantly. But um, personally, I mean, yeah, I would say Snapchat was the most popular for sure, but it could be, you know, just regular iMessage on the iPhone or also Instagram um, maybe Facebook Messenger, but I think Facebook wasn't super popular when I was in high school. So I would definitely say either Snapchat or Instagram, for sure. Those would be the, the most two I'd be concerned. But Snapchat's definitely number one, in my opinion. Just like, because I said those messages just erased instantly. So, no problem. Great question. And then just to go off of that as well, so one of the big things with Snapchat is a lot of kids, they can make a private Snapchat story. So that's then instead of every single person that that child is friends with and has on that account, they can go through and select maybe the 20 people that they absolutely know are purchasing the vapes. Along with also Instagram, Instagram also has a private friends only Instagram story. So that's again, that student, whether they might have hundreds of followers, if they know there's a select few who are buying those objects, then they can go through a story and select those certain children and put them just on a story seeing those objects as well for them to kind of message and just slide up. And like Jonathan said, with the Snapchat, they go away within 24 hours. And there's even a button if you hold down, you can delete the message pretty quickly. So those are probably the two most frequent for social media. Thank you, Talia. Other questions from the audience? Right here, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for volunteering your time. I think this is a very important topic. Um, uh, talking about signs, uh, I don't know, uh, like a, a lot of our kids are involved in athletic activities. Is athletic performance a, or changing athletic performance as a sign for, uh, for vaping. Anybody want to touch that? I'm not a doctor, but I know it does affect your lungs. Um, so yeah, it's gonna affect them in their performance. Um, running out there, they're not gonna be able to run. They're gonna be coughing up a lot, um, throwing up, stuff like that. I would think behaviorally too, like um, as far as lost interest. So I lost interest in sports because I was obsessed with partying and hanging out with friends and that became more important than the priorities that I should have had my eyes on. So um, change in, in interest w in sports would be a huge um, indicator for sure. Another email uh, directed to you, Anthony, uh, and obviously uh, George is here in chat, maybe they can weigh in too, in terms of um, there's only a six hour day in school or whatever, but um, with success that Anthony has had talking to our different groups of kids, would it make sense in having someone to come in to really talk hands on about vaping? Thoughts uh, from you, Anthony, as someone who yeah. does public speaking? I would say absolutely. Um, when I was asked originally by um, Naprin to do this, I think I said no first because <laughs> I don't know anything about vaping. I don't, I'm 41 years old um, and my kids are really young, but I wanted to learn more about it and I'm so happy that we put this together the way we did because I think um, even those last couple of questions getting answered were huge. But having a speaker, um, a vape specific speaker, like somebody like a surviving lung transplant kid that was vaping would be huge. Um, that would be super impactful for kids because they could be like, whoa, I thought I was just like having a little fun and trying something. I didn't know that I could like have a lung transplant. That would be uh, really amazing. And, and for kids that don't know, um, having someone talk about the lingo would be huge just to know what to look out for with their friends. Because I think when I go and speak to students at schools, 
I'm directing my talk at like, let's all look at the warning signs. Look at the warning signs in your friends. Look at the, you know, like, let's create this village, this community that can like look out for each other. Um, and I think that that would be, I think a specific speaker would be amazing. And I think, um, I just wanna to touch on one more thing real quick, going back to the, the coping and what is the school doing and what can people do at the school. I think what we showed tonight community-wise is that we have resources. So I'm just the person who was a drug addict, but I happen to be a person who works in town. I'm very public, my story's public, I'm a resource. Resource, resource, resource. Now, all of these resources that we have here in town are like um, accessible, right? You can talk to them at any time. And I think we all know that teachers and school administrators and cops and firefighters and counselors didn't take their jobs as like a get rich quick. <laughs> they do it because they love it and they wanna help. So we can reach out to any one of them at any time and they'll give us like full support. And I think that's what this community is all about. And I think, you know, in working with both George and Chet and their staffs, our school department is open to a lot of these different ideas. And we've had success with Anthony at the, at the high school level. And I think we'll have follow-up conversations of how we can maybe incorporate that uh, for next school year. Other questions from the audience? Right here, sir. I, I just had a general community question. Like in, in town here, how prevalent is the drug problem? What kind of drugs are we seeing in town? And then to Anthony's point, are we seeing any causal connection between the increase in vaping and the vaping awareness and then the, any kind of increase in, into that gateway that you were talking about, Anthony? Let's start quick, but then I'm gonna pass it down. Um, I get to see a lot of kids in town, so I get to hear a lot of them talk. And um, I don't think North Andover has a drug problem bigger than any other town around. Kids are trying things. Kids just happen to be right now trying vaping. That's then leading to vaping weed, and that's how easy it is. Then they go down this path. Um, but I think the, for it to start so small, um, but then for it to spread, I just think that's what we need to look out for. Um, and I totally forgot what I was going to say, so I'm going to pass it down. <laughs> Actually, before, before I get to you. And education is the most important thing. You know, I, I, I referred to um, D.A.R.E. and how it was all about just don't try anything. But I think that it's so much more impactful to be able to say to kids, hey, if you try a pill, that could be, uh, you know, it could be Oxycontin and you don't know what it is. And these, this is, these are the effects it's gonna have on your body. And, and to hear like some of the stuff of coming off the pills, it's nasty. Like uh, Anthony just spoke to the high school and, um, and talked about how difficult that is. And I think that that education is so important for the students because what happens too is they'll vape a little, maybe they'll go to marijuana and think like, well, this isn't that bad. I'm not like, I'm not, you know, dropping out of school and I'm still able to hang out and do all these things. So then that's where it becomes a gateway because they go to the next thing because they were taught drugs are bad, period. So the education piece is just crucial to be able to say, you may think that, okay, it's not a big deal if I'm vaping a little marijuana, but this is what it may be leading to next. And these are the consequences of now using that drug and so on. So that's just really important. Sorry. <laughs> totally, yeah. No, I, I, I was thinking about our town as a whole and how I grew up and how easy it was for me to hide. So we live in a very comfortable town. So when our kids are using something, they're hiding in big houses. They're driving in nice cars. They're not seeing the effects of drug use in their friends because a lot of like big houses and nice cars and like the comfort that we have in town, it hides the problem a little bit. So where cities like Lawrence, people are able to like see the effects. Kids can see like, wow, that's bad. But where someone who's on drugs and I got caught by my parents smoking weed, right? And the first thing my parents said was like, don't tell anyone. <laughs> so don't talk to other parents, don't spread the word that you, that you did this, it's embarrassing, right? So like, that's kind of like keeping it going and it's, it's preventing kids from seeing the real dangers and 
when we're in town, we're always really comfortable. And I think that's part of the problem. So creating a little bit of uncomfort and like reality helps. I think uh, Anthony nailed it. Um, I think obviously there are drugs in town. I don't think North Andover has a big drug problem at all. Probably the biggest problem is probably the vaping amongst the kids and stuff like that. But um, I will say I didn't grow up in North Andover and I love living here. I can't wait to, to have my kids grow up in North Andover because it does not have those problems that Anthony talked about. You could see it in the open in Lawrence. We don't have those issues here in North Andover. Now, I'm not saying there isn't any drugs here in North Andover. Of course there is, but it's not a major problem in my opinion. Neil? Uh, speaking from the EMS aspect, from the fire department, we, we also run the ambulance service here in town. And the statistics that we track are specific to polysubstance overdose or um, you know whatever the drug of choice is. What we don't track, and as of right now, we don't have a way to track it, is how they're using that substance. So is it an overdose through a vape? Is it an overdose through a needle? Is it an overdose through pills or however? Um, that's something that we're actually getting a new program and we may incorporate that. Um, that being said, our numbers of overdoses have declined over the past couple of years and the age bracket is not majority in the high school age. It's more 30s. Thank you, Neil. Without getting too far into the whole aspect of that. I do want to be respectful to your time as well as our panel and our educators and professionals that are here today. But I do want to turn it over to Lisa Roberts for a minute. Lisa, if you don't know her, is heading up North End over Parents Resort Network. This is actually a program that's been around for a number of years. It kind of stopped for a little bit, and Lisa has uh, resurrected it, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the program and what our hope for in the future with Napron. Hi everyone, thank you. And thank you guys for doing this. They all volunteered their time to do this. So I'm super appreciative of this. And I'm really proud of our community. Not, not only that we came together, but we're, we're aiming at trying to squash something that's really dangerous for our kids and so highly addictive. So like he said earlier, first of all, I do wanna say, North End of a Parent Resource, and you've heard NAPRIN, they're the same thing, I'm gonna lean into it. It's a weird name, but that's the abbreviation everyone says, so if you hear that, that's what they're talking about. Um, uh, like he said, this is not just a one-off, we're gonna continue this conversation, so hopefully next month we're gonna bring someone back. I tend to do the smaller discussion groups at the library in town, Stevens Memorial, but it may change depending on, on how many people are interested in that and the topic. Again, we're gonna kinda get together as a group and decide on that. And I'm happy to announce Anthony has agreed to come back in the fall and do a presentation for parents. I hear, I've heard from both my girls about him talking at the school and I kept, you know, you ask a teen, what do you say, what do you say, what do you say, and it's Psh, nothing. So we're going to finally learn what he talks about and I, he's, as you saw tonight, he's a great speaker, so I think it's going to be captivating and educational, but it's going to be great, so thank you in advance, Anthony. Um, and the other thing is, on all the handouts and on the flyers, there's a QR code that leads you directly to our website. On our website is where a lot of you, not all of you, it's totally fine, signed up for the event and you get my emails. But if you go to the top right, there's a resource tab. Go down there and I've added, I've doubled the amount of resources for vaping on there. So go check that out. There's good resources on how to quit. There's resources on how to talk to your teens or tweens or kid about this stuff. There's, a, there's resources for anxiety, eating disorders, everything, but the, the amount of vaping resources has doubled. So go check that out. And I'm gonna add some more tonight. Like Neil said, he's gonna give me some. So just frequently go back if you have any questions. An email, I'm happy to answer emails. I did get a couple questions about other resources. I shot off emails for that, um, but just send some emails and topics. The most important thing tonight, though, is if you like this show that you saw tonight, show, 
if you like this event, <laughs> here's a show. Um, he's right. I do a lot of this on my own. Tonight, this was a panel of a lot of people who got involved. So there's a big team behind this event. It wasn't just me. It was the youth center. It was a collaboration of all of them. But when I do events throughout the year, a lot of the times it is just me. So if there's anyone out there who knows someone or if maybe you want to join my team, and I say team loosely right now, please email because I could really use the help and carry this on because there's a lot, of, lot more good things we can do in the community. So send me an email, talk to me after this, or if you know someone, nudge them my, my way. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Lisa, thanks. And again, contact her to get involved. I do want to say uh, Brian Frazier and NA Cam has been phenomenal. They're taping tonight. We didn't tell everybody that ahead of time because we didn't want everyone just to stay home. Uh, but please, tell your friends. Uh, Brian's going to get that up of when it will be played. We'll play it a number of times. Encourage your friends to actually watch this, listen to these people that were here tonight. I think it's a really great community event. I spoke to Superintendent Gilligan today, and we had an honest conversation that sometimes a community shies away from a little bit of putting on a community event for whatever reason. I think what we proved here tonight from the school department, the police department, the youth center, everybody that was involved, the fire department, that this is a worthwhile thing to do, to have a conversation to uh, educate and make people aware. Uh, and I think we all took something out of here tonight. So I appreciate NACAM's gonna continue this for us. We're gonna continue this. One of the first things when I met Lisa, I'm not a believer in one-offs. You know, if we're just gonna bring in some speaker and then we never follow up with that, then it was probably really good for 24 hours. But we need to continue to work together as a community. I think we proved tonight, this is why North Andover is a pretty special community. It's the reason why I've loved being here as long as I've been here. So we'll continue to fight these issues as well as every other one. How about a final applause for our great kid? <laughs> Italia and Brianna are going to be up here. For anybody that wants to see some of the, uh, the material that we have here, it would be good to just take a look at it, familiarize yourself. Thank you very much for coming and pass the word around. Thank you.